And so it is. I have a sermon for you today that's really touching my heart because of the generation that I'm living in. And it's something that's really challenging me, especially at my age. I'm 38 years of age. I know it's hard, eh? I'm 28, eh? It's difficult to think that I'm 38. I'm 38 at the moment. I'm not 28. You know, we'll leave it there. But there is something that God has really been pumping my heart and challenging me as a young 38 year old living in this generation with so many things that are going on. And seeing the things that are happening in our surroundings and seeing the things that are going on, especially in our younger generation, there is a challenge and something that God is really placing and nudging me a bit and propelling me a bit to encourage you, whoever is here, this evening. The thing that I have for us this evening simply says, it's a family affair. It's a family affair. The theme for our church this month, it's all about family. And the importance of family and the fundamentals of why God himself instituted family. God himself, in essence, is a family. God the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, intrinsically, is a family. And it's God's destiny and God's desire for families to succeed, for families to prosper, for families to be blessed, because he's a God intrinsically who is familiar, who is family. And I'm grateful for this opportunity because I believe and God is really challenging me about families and the importance of families. The importance of you father. The importance of you mother. The importance of you sister. Every single person in this place is valuable, has intrinsic worth, and God desires for you to be a part of his family. Amen. 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 Because there's something about God's nature is that God is a relational God. You think only you get attracted to other women or you get attracted to men? God was the one who was attracted to his creation. And there's something intrinsically in the nature of God that he created you in his image accordance to his likeness. You are the pinnacle of God's creation. And so it is because you're the pinnacle of God's creation, God has given you intrinsic value. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7 and 9. This is a family affair. It's a family affair. It's all about family. God is a God who is about family. And today I want to challenge you to understand why God was doing this to the Israelites in order for them to understand the importance of you and me and us and this church and family. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 7 and 9. Let's read. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road and when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your heads and bind them on your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. I'm going to read it again, just in case it didn't hit the right spot. But I'm going to hit the right spot tonight. For you. 1, 2, 3, verse 7. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home. When you walk along the road. When you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hand. And bind them on your forehead. Write them on your door frames, your houses, and your gates. There's something that God has really been tapping on my spirit. And I was had the opportunity to go and preach at one of the matriarchs in my family. And I was the last speaker before everyone carries the box out. Such a privilege. And here I am as a non-credential pastor. And you've got the pastor of the Mormon church and the pastor of the Wesleyan church and the pastor of the uh, Mount of All church. And here I am as the last speaker speaking in this funeral. Such a privilege and honor, and I thought, oh my, what a challenge it is. But I knew this lady, she was a matriarch in my family. And the thing that kept hitting me when I kept speaking, I was speaking on the importance of God and legacy. And how God, our parents pushed us to find God. Our parents, with whatever things that they had, they did their best with whatever resources, with whatever they could, because of the limited resources that they had migrating to Australia. They pushed us to find God. And when I saw this matriarch passing on, we used to go to her house, we used to visit her house, we used to go there and there was a family structure. My uncle was still alive, he passed away in 
passed away years ago, we'd still go to this auntie's house, we'd sleep over her house, and God really started tapping something in my heart. And when I saw this lady pass on, I said to myself, wow, I'm 38 years of age, and this woman is passing on one of the matriarchs in my family. I saw another uncle of mine, a patriarch in the family, passing on. I saw another auntie of mine passing on. I saw another uncle of mine passing on. And the thing that really God impressed on my heart, saying, hey, now the next generation is moving on. Now the next generation, the older matriarchs and patriarchs that we used to look up to as our team, uncle, we used to eat at their houses, we used to enjoy their food, moving on. And God's calling them to return in. The challenge is how about now you and my generation and at the moment, God is speaking to the Israelites. This is the context of this place. God has just come to the Israelites and is encouraging them and challenging them. They're in the wilderness right now, 400 years in captivity. And now they're in this place on the, on the plains of Moab. They're ready to go and receive the promised land that their forefathers was promised, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. A lot of us, young people that are sitting right there, your forefathers, your grandpa, your grandma, your auntie, your grandpa, they played over you. And you think that you got yourself to where you are, not realize that you're walking on the blessing of what your forefathers did for you, and you're just walking, thinking to yourself, oh, what's going on, mom? And it's because of the prayers of your forefathers. Amen. And this is what was happening in Israel. They were walking on the blessing of their forefathers, and now they're ready for a miracle. It's a transition period. They were transitioning leadership from Moses to Joshua eventually. They were transitioning the people group in order for them to be able to get ready for the promised land. And God comes using Moses as his mouthpiece. He begin to tell the people of Israel his plan and his will for their lives. I'm here as the mediator from God to encourage you, brother, and encourage you, sister, in the situation that you're in right now, to tell you God's will and his love for you and how much he cares for you while you're walking in the wilderness. Amen. And this is exactly what's happening. They're in the wilderness, and God loves them so much. And God is encouraged by them, and then he begins to turn his heart. He begins to challenge the Israelites. And you begin to see the heart of God. His desire for his chosen people. The set apart people. The Israelites. You and I have been set apart because of Jesus Christ and what he's done on Calvary. And God has a design for you and a plan for you today. Not tomorrow, today. And I'm here as the Moses to speak to you in your wilderness. What are you going through in your life? I do not know. But Moses begins to speak to the Israelites. And it begins to challenge you. And I'm going to bring three little topics quickly. Five minutes. Let's hit it, go through it, and then encourage you in your journey of Christianity, in your journey called life. My first point. Moses encourages the Israelites through God, saying that, hey, if there's something important for your family, if there's something to build your family upon, it's one, the fear of God. Amen. Amen. Deuteronomy chapter 6 verse 2, this is what he says. So that you and your children and their children after them may fear the Lord, your God, as long as you live keeping all these decrees, the commands that I have given you, so that you may enjoy long life. Listen to the heartbeat of God. And listen what, to what he wants for the Israelites. He says to them, the decision that you make today, the choice that you make today, that when you begin to place your family in the hands of God, it's not only going to flow through your life, but brother, your children's life, your children's children's life, and their children's children's life, and their children's children's life. And then he gives us a little secret. He says, do these things and listen to my commands. You will live long on this earth. Amen. My father passed away. He was 53 years old. I was only 21. 
It is my prayer at the moment, as a person who's lost my pops for nearly 16, 17 years, that when I stand here, I'm able to say, you know what? Because of the things that he's done for me, I continue to walk, continue to live, continue to uh, obey God and his commands. Why? Because my father, his last words to me, son, my desire is for you to love God and love God with all your heart. I held that and I ran with it and never turned back. What was the commands that God was telling the Israelites? What was he trying to tell them when he says, listen to my decrees and that you fear the Lord so that you will have a long life? If you go back to the chapter 5, he's talking about the Ten Commandments. And he says, these are my commands and my laws. The Ten Commandments was a framework. Was something for them to abide by and live by in order to keep the community, the peace within the community. Amen. To keep the harmony between you and your brother and your sister and the community. It's funny because even in this generation, when you go to the law, they still use the Ten Commandments as a template for them to be able to judge people. But here God is saying, hey, the decrees that I want you to obey and listen to, my commands, is the Ten Commandments. In chapter 5, verse 6 to verse 21. First commandment, you will love no other God but me. Second one, you shall make no idols other than me. But the thing that's different about this in Exodus, he says, when you make no idols, he says, I'm a jealous God. Did you know that you serve a God who's jealous? And he hates when someone has priority over him because he created you as his most, uh, the pinnacle of his creation? Amen. Did you know God, the God that you serve is a God who's jealous and loves you so much that when you put other idols or other people or prioritize your children or prioritize your partner or prioritize your wife or prioritize anybody above him, he's a jealous God? Because you always wanted him to be the pinnacle of your faith and the reason for your being. You say I'm not uh, talk about the Lord's name in vain. Keep the Sabbath day holy. Honor your father and mother. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. Praise the Lord. You shall not bear false witness. You should not covet your neighbor. Fearing God. He says this is the formula in order for your family to succeed. This is what we need as a family affair. As something that we should hold dear to us. Fear God. Proverbs 9 verse 10, it says the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom and the knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. Proverbs chapter 10 verse 21, it says the fear of the Lord prolongs life. Why do I fear God? My father passed away young. Why am I fearing God? Why? Because my desire is to prolong my life. Amen. Amen. Because we fear in God requires obedience to His commands. Yeah. Amen. And if God says to you, hey, listen to me, if you obey my commands, live long. Right there in the Bible, if you obey me and listen to my words, live long and prosper. Amen. 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 But why do we choose otherwise but his adamant and encourages us? Proverbs 10, 27, the fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be shortened. Listen to God's love for you, Proverbs 14, 26. In the fear of the Lord, there is strong confidence and his children will have refuge. I've got two boys. One's 12, one's eight. And I'll never forget, because I believe I'm standing here because of my mum's prayers. And my mum used to always challenge us and encourage us and tell us to love the Lord. And tell us to do this and do that. And all of a sudden, bang, I got married with the most beautiful girl in the whole of this building. <laughs> that hot mama, hot mama right there. And I finally got married to her. And then my life started transitioning. Listen to this. Same thing with the Israelites. My life transitioned. I became a single man into a married man. And from a married man, I became a father. And then now I begin to realize my mum's words. Israel is in a transition and it's time now to pass the ball and transfer and the reason why this sermon means so much to me because that's the, that's the season that we're in at the moment where 
where our forefathers and the matriarchs and the patriarchs of our family are moving on to eternity. Now the ball is being passed to you. Amen. Amen. Now the ball's been passed to me. Catch it. Amen. And I know the desire of our parents was always for the best for our lives. Hallelujah. See the great commission it says, therefore go into the, into the world making disciples and baptizing people of every nation in the name of the Father, Son and Holy Spirit. Listen to this part. And teaching them to obey everything I have what? Commanded you. And surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. This was the command of Jesus. Not the great request. It was the great commission. All of us were commissioned by God to go into all the world. And to see people come to the knowledge of Christ. And to bless their lives. And Jesus promises that he'll be with us at the very end of the age if we obey his commands. Deuteronomy chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. My second point, love God. Fear God. Second point is, love God. Listen to what he's trying to tell the Israelites. Israel, fear God first. That's the beginning of wisdom. That's what prolongs your life. Second, he says, why don't you love God? Deuteronomy 6, verse 4 and 5, it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your what? Strength. Here is the Israelites in the midst of their transition in life. And God is speaking to them, getting ready for, it's like a, it's like a basketball coach getting the pep talk ready before the playoffs. It's like the, your auntie giving you a pep talk about how naughty you are and her desire for you to become a better person. He, he, God is giving Israel a pep talk. Ready to be able to conquer the promised land and all its difficulties and all its hardships and all the things that they're ready to face. And God gives them a formulation. Fear me. A lot of times when we talk about fear, we think of fear as being scared of. Amen. And then we think, why am I being scared of God? Why should I fear God? And yes, you may look at it in that way, but I see it in the positive light. I remember when I was a young kid, and when I used to think of doing bad with all my peers in, in school, I used to always say to myself, man, I fear doing these naughty things because it's going to make my mum and dad look bad and it's going to ruin their reputation. Amen. And that's the kind of thing that God is trying to draw here when he says fear God. The definition of fearing is to have reverence and to honor God with your life. So when it says about fearing God, it means that you honor him with everything that you have with your life and you revere him for the things he's done for you. Yes. Not to be scared of him, but to draw closer to him because of what he's done for you. It compels you to move. Amen. Oh, I fear not walking with the cup of tea in case I spill the cup of tea on the carpet and my mum and my wife's going to give me a madeshi. Yes? It's that kind of fear. The fear that if I do something, it's going to let them down, it's going to make them upset. And that's the same fear that God requires of you and me. Not to be scared, but to say, man, God, for what you've done for me, I don't want to do anything that wants to dishonor you because of your love for me and what you've done for my life. Amen. Amen. He says, love God with all your heart. Everyone has heard of this. Why was God so adamant about loving him and, and no one else? Why in the Ten Commandments God was so concerned about making him Lord and not idolizing anything else in the commandments? And then he says he love the Lord God, O oh, hero of Israel, the Lord God, the Lord God is one. And then he says, love the Lord with all your heart. Why is he adamant about this? In this nation, there is so much temptation around. And there's polytheism. There's different gods and different nations serving different gods. It's kind of like in the generation we live in now. Where we live in a multicultural nation. And there's so many religions that we're a part of because of multiculturalism. And we come here, we hear of the Muslims speaking about God. We hear of the Mormons speaking about God. We hear of other nationalities, Buddhists speaking about who they believe. We hear about other Hindus speaking about who they believe. 
And then because we're so in the melting pot of so many different faiths, God is trying to say, hey, I want you to understand that I'm a true God. Amen. And I should be honored and I should be served. And there should be no compromise. I remember I had a friend who said to me, oh, you know, I'm a Muslim. Are we serve the same God? No, we don't. No, we don't, brother. Oh, we don't believe in Jesus, no, but we believe in you. have to say, no, I believe that Jesus Christ is Lord and my Savior and came as a man, died on the cross, rose again, so that I, and he'll come back again to redeem humanity back to himself. That's the message of the cross. That's the God I serve. Amen. Amen. So he says to them, it's a family thing. This is for all of you. This is for everyone that's sitting in this building. This is the desire of God for you. Fear God. Love God. My last point as I conclude, point number three. This is what he says. Hey, I want you to teach God to the rest of your generation. Amen? Amen. Verse six. These commandments, these commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts, he says. And then we get to the verse that we're in now. After saying that, and as I share the verse, he says to you, impress them on your children. Hallelujah. This is the part that we've got now. Talking about teaching God to your generation, to your children. There is an onus, there is a challenge, and there is something that you father and you mother, and what God desires from you is that his desire from you is to teach your children about this God. Some of you guys had broken families, which is understandable. You didn't have a father, a role model in order to listen to. Some of you didn't have a mother because you grew up in a broken family. But God's intention to the Israelites, intention for you that's sitting here, that was in that situation, is that God's desire for you is for you to understand who he is. And parents, it says teach God to your children. And as the verse that I spoke on, the reason why I'm saying it's all about family. And God's desire is to keep the family unit together. How? See God, love God, and teach your children about God. And this is what he says. He says, impress them on your children. Talk about them. Talk about them when you sit down at home, when you walk along the road, when you lie down, when you get up. Tie them with symbols on your neck and your hands, bind them around your forehead, write them on your doorpost. What's God trying to say to Israel? Here. He says, hey, before you go into the promised land, I want you to do something very important. Understand that my commands are in your reach, right in front of you, before you. That every time you're ready to go through issues in your life, grab the word of God, bind it in your life, hold it together in order to keep your family together in the storm. Use my scripture, use my word, use my command in order to sustain your family. That regardless of whatever it is that stands ahead of you, whatever it is that you're ready to face, he says, hey, take my word, teach it to your children and your children's children so they come to understand who I am as God over their lives. Amen. It's a family affair. It's a family affair. Why is God significant and important for your life? Why do I keep reiterating and repeating why God is important for your life? He says here, impart it to your kids. He says he impress it on your kids. You know the word diligently? When it says diligently teach your children in the ways of God, the word diligent means repeat. 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 Repeat, repeat, repeat. And it's not the timetables. God is trying to say, teach your children and repeat, and repeat. Put it on replay, 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 replay. And this is the same thing he's trying to say, like timetables. 9 1 to 9, 9 2 to 18, 9 3 to 27, 9 4 to 36, 9 5 to 45, timetable. 9 6 to 54, 9 7. 72, 9, 9, 6, 
As our worship team comes to play, 